Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this meeting of the Eastern Area Planning Committee, which is one of the three area based planning committees of Dorset Council. For the benefit of the public, I am Councillor Tony Coombs and I'm chairman of this committee. I would first of all like to introduce you to our officer support team today. We have Mike Garrity, head of planning, Kim Cow, principal planning officer, Liz Adams, planning case officer, James Weir, conservation officer, Oliver Hayden, who's also a planning case officer, Chelsea Gollidge, who will be reading out our public representations, Philip Crowther and Hannah Massey, who are our solicitors, and David Northover, our committee support officer. I'd also like to thank all the officers behind the scenes who are making today's virtual meeting possible. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Council has had to put in place measures to enable the Council's decision-making processes to continue whilst keeping safe members of the public, councillors and council staff in accordance with the government's guidance on social distancing by applying new regulations for holding committee meetings from remote locations. At the annual meeting of Council on the 4th of May 2021, it was agreed that all Council meetings that are not executive in nature would continue to be held virtually from the 7th of May until such time as social distancing requirements were removed on the 19th of July. We had hoped to be able to return to face-to-face -to -face meetings. However, with the uncertainty caused by rising cases in Dorset, the Council has resolved to continue with virtual meetings until later on in October. Where a decision is required, committee members will express a minded to decision in respect to the recommendations set out in the officer reports, with decisions being taken under dele officer delegated authority. Mike Garrity is the appropriate officer in attendance today to enact any minded to decision. The meeting is being live streamed to the public and a copy of the recording of the meeting will be available on the website afterwards. Public participation will take the form of written statements as opposed to public speaking. And we will follow the agenda as has been published. I will now go through the roll call. Do we have any apologies for absence, David? One apology, Chairman, from Councillor Barry Gorringe. Thank you. So if I go through the committee just to confirm that everyone is here. Shane Bartlett, Vice Chairman. Present, Madam Chairman. Mike Barron. Present, Madam Chairman. Alex Brenton. Present, Madam Chairman. Robin Cook. Present, Madam Chairman. Mike Dyer. Present, Madam Chairman. Barry Goringer sent his apologies. David Morgan. Present, Madam Chairman. Julie Robinson. Present, Madam Chairman. David Took. Present, Madam Chairman. Bill Trite. Present, Madam Chairman. And John Worth. Present, Madam Chairman. Fantastic. Good morning to you all. The next item on the agenda is declarations of pecuniary or other conflict of interest, bias or predetermination. Do we have any declarations? Uh, could I just make a brief statement here, Madam Chairman? Yep. Could you just confirm your name and switch your camera on, please, Bill? Sorry, it's uh, Councillor Bill Trout here. Um, I think this is probably the best point to, at which to say that my uh, um, views in respect of item five on the agenda go back a long way and have been made clear to the Swanage Town Council um, uh, very publicly. Uh, consequently, I will not take any part in the discussion or debate uh, under item five, <clears throat> uh, nor uh, will I participate in the actual decision, but I will, as the uh, local member with your permission, I will uh, make a uh, statement at the appropriate point prior to the committee's deliberation. That's fine. Thank you very much for making that declaration, Bill. And yes, of course, I will I'll let you have your minutes of fame after we've done the public representation before we go into the debate. Thank you. OK, item three on the agenda are the minutes of the previous meeting on the 25th of August. Can I ask the committee to note those? Noted. Noted. Thank you. Thank you. 
OK, so public participation, as I alluded to earlier, members of the public have been invited to submit written representations which are limited to 450 words. The maximum number of representations accepted are three under each category and are accepted in strict date and time order. Uh, this morning, we don't have an issue with the number of people that have asked to speak, but on one of the applications, two of the representations um, were more, one of them was certainly more than double what is allowed and the other representation was also over the limit. So I have made the decision that we will stick to the sentence that contains the 450th word and then the rest of the representation will not be read out. Both um, members of the public were notified of the word limit and given plenty of time to ensure that they were able to do that. Members of Dorset Council who are not members of the committee and as has been pointed out to me on the front page of the agenda, not just members who are not on the pension fund committee, so I apologise for that typo. Uh, so any member of Dorset Council who wishes to address the committee will be allowed to speak. Requests. And David, did we have any members of the pub, uh, the council that wish to speak to us? Uh, none other than that uh, has already been accounted for, Chairman. OK, thank you. And are there any representations from the public that do not relate to matters on the agenda today? No, Chairman. OK, thank you. So moving on to the schedule of planning applications, we have two applications before us today. Have there been any requests for deferrals or withdrawals, please? Morning, Madam Chairman, Kim Cowell here. Um, no, there have been no requests for deferrals or withdrawals. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So background information related to the applications before us today has been available for inspection by members prior to the meeting, and that covers consultations, objections and representations, as well as the East Dorset and Purbeck local plans and the council's related policies. In each case, I will invite the case officer to introduce their item. Members of the public, planning agents, applicants and town and parish councils have been invited to make written submissions. And these will be read out by Chelsea College, who I need to point out has not been involved with the merits of either of the applications, but is only providing technical support. They will be read out in the following order. Public against the application, public in support, the applicant agent, town or parish council and then local member. Following the public participation section of every item, I will ask officers if there are any salient points they wish to clarify. And then I will open up the debate for members. Can I remind members that please direct any remarks and questions through myself and I will invite members to speak in turn. Requests to speak need to be made via the chat facility only, please. And please keep your microphones on mute when you're not speaking to maintain audio quality. At the end of the debate, for transparency, I will take the vote by roll call and the vote will be recorded as such in the minutes if three or more members make the necessary request. I will also ask members to confirm that they've heard the entire presentation and debate before they cast their vote. So we are now going to move on to agenda item five, the first of the presentations. And this item is 6 2021 0048, erection of ground floor entrance porch, bay window extensions at ground and first floor levels and Juliet balcony at second floor to front brackets north elevation, conversion and extension of existing outbuilding to the rear bracket south for habitable accommodation with connecting glazed link from first floor level of house. Alterations to windows and doors at one old Coast Guard cottages, Peveril Point Road, Swanage. And that is pages 21 to 44 on your agenda. So with that, Quite convoluted intro. Liz Adams, over to you, please. Good morning, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, good morning, members. I'm presenting this item today on behalf of Carrie Waldridge, who's the case officer.
moment please while I find the right bit to click. OK, so the nominated officer has identified this application to come before the planning committee in the light of the concerns raised by ward members and uh, ward member and the town council in relation to the impacts on the character and appearance of the surrounding properties and on the Swanage conservation area on neighbouring amenity and the Dorset AOMB, amongst other issues. Comments have also been received from local residents, both against and for the proposals. So the site is located in Swanage. And this extract from the Swanage local plan shows the site, uh, which lies within the area of high townscape value, which is the pink. And also we see here it's within the Swanage Conservation Area, which is all this coloured area. And Zone 5, which is the pink one, is basically a physical sub area within the conservation area, which has particular characteristics. So one old Coast Guard Cottages is an end of terrace house and it forms part of an eight dwelling terrace um, fronting both the coastline and Swanage Bay. So the terrace is located at the far eastern end of Swanage Bay and it's, this area is accessed by a single road that also serves the RNLI lifeboat station and um, a number of other dwellings as well as the Coast Guard lookout point at the end of Peveril Point. The relevant characteristics of the conservation area are set out at paragraph 15.3 of your report. Um, in brief, these are the largely undeveloped character of the sub area the uh, irregular pattern of buildings, although they're mainly rectilinear in, in form, the views across within and out of the, uh, the conservation area and uh, mixed architectural styles, including minimalist modern architecture, together with a consistency of materials, um, predominantly render stucco um, slate tiles. So this is the terrace and this is our site here. And Old Coast Guard Cottages, this terrace, is noted in the conservation area appraisal as having a simple yet bold form. Um, Historic England recently declined to list the buildings, but they are considered by your officers to represent undesignated heritage assets. Uh, and that's for the reason set out paragraph 15.7 of your report. So uh, number one and number eight obviously form a sort of a bookend between the other two storey properties. And the house is located on the long narrow plot, as we see here, um, which is enclosed by a stonewall garden at the front. And the garden to the rear rises steeply to Pebble Point Road. Uh, directly to the west of the property as uh, a shared passageway and stone steps. And there's also a passageway along the rear of the terrace, which is, is a shared access. Um, that's located at ground floor level. And then the rear gardens, because they rise, the outbuildings tend to all be on a higher level. So the proposal includes changes to the front elevation. This is existing and this is the proposed. And these comprise a two storey um, front bay window and a second floor Juliet balcony together with a side porch. So the proposed increase in the height of this uh, second storey window can be achieved under permitted development regulations and uh, it's not considered by officers that the glazed Juliet balcony will detract from the appearance of the dwelling. Then we've got the porch uh, roof here. Um, it's pitched, you'll see in a minute, but the front element references the front um, elements on the existing porches on the terrace. And although this proposed porch will be at the end here, it doesn't maintain symmetry because you can see at number eight, there's a much larger two storey side extension that's been put on a long time ago, I understand. Um, in the context of the terrace and the conservation area, it's considered that the modest form of the porch um, won't result in harm to the conservation area, that is. Uh, the applicant has provided an indicative 3D drawing, um, but he has subsequently agreed that it would be appropriate for the element that separates the two bays, the glazed part, to um, be white. So I've just added that in just to under so you can see the difference that makes, um, which is what is proposed on the uh, elevation plan anyway. These indicative plans are not part of the proposed um, plans condition. But I think it's helpful probably um, in the interest of clarity if uh, another uh, condition is added. So I've just worded one here, um, 
this, it could be this condition or you may want to change condition eight. Uh, so in the first instance and on all subsequent occasions, the ground and first floor front bay window should be separated by white panels to match the existing dwelling. Uh, and I believe that that would achieve a better consistency with the property at number eight. Um, subject to conditions controlling materials which are proposed, um, it's considered that the changes to the front elevation will avoid impact on identified elements of the conservation area. So the rectilinear form of the plot is maintained, uh, the materials are characteristic in the sub area and the views won't be harmed. So uh, within the zone five sub area, the modern design elements can be achieved without harm to the significance of the conservation area as a designated heritage asset. Uh, now in respect of um, the property itself, um, MPPF paragraph national planning policy framework that is paragraph 203 requires that when we're considering development that will affect a non-designated heritage asset there's a need to make a balanced judgment and this has to be in the light of the significance of the heritage asset itself and the scale of harm. So your office has considered the proposals will not result in harm to the historic interest or setting of the building which is set out in the report and won't make uh, an impact on the positive contribution that the building makes to the conservation area. Um, whilst the bay window is not identical to that at number eight, the two properties are viewed in the context of the terrace and the bay will restore a symmetry of form with number eight with the addition of this projection, it's not considered that the changes would detract from the architectural interest of the terrace. Uh, so I've got some more photos of the context of the building. Oh, sorry, those are just going to ping up again. There you go. And um, so this is the view from uh, the sort of the downs, the, um, the cliff top walk that you can do um, over the top. You just mainly see the roof. Um, closer views of the property are obviously obtained from the bridal way and this is right up close next to the private um, back gardens. So um, looking at the side of the property, um, windows can be achieved in the side elevation under permitted development, although usually they would be um, obscure glazed above, uh, above ground floor level. Um, the main consideration is the impact um, in terms of visual on the side porch and as we see here it's, it's modest as, as previously mentioned. Um, this section plan also shows the proposed rear glaze link into the existing outbuilding and then the extension back into the hillside which is this element here with the garden reinstated above. Um, just working through the other proposals, so you can see uh, there's some internal works proposed, but they don't require planning permission as the property isn't listed. Um, the proposed floor plan we see here, the, the bay window and the attached porch projection. And then at first floor level, this is existing, uh, first floor level we can see um, the side, sorry, side window uh, going to serve the living room, this one here and the existing window is increased in height to match um, to match it. That's the server landing. And then you can see the glazing in the rear of the porch at the roof level and the, gla and the glaze link then that, that projects back to the outbuilding. And here we see the bathroom created from the uh, excavation into the hillside. Um, and here this is showing how where the glaze link would fit in to the building. At second floor, um, again, we've got a small window that, that is to serve an ensuite. And you can see the roof here. So existing mono pitch roof will be replaced by a fully pitched roof, which is in keeping with other outbuildings serving the terrace. So these are photographs from the rear. Some works have already started to take place. They could be done under permitted development rights. Um, the old Coast Guard cottages have a range of outbuildings to their rear, which are mentioned in the conservation area appraisal as interesting. Um, there are varying sizes, heights, roof forms and ages, and they're positioned on the rising hillside at the immediately at the rear, as you can see. Um, so this is the... Yeah, what is it? this is the application site outbuilding. We've got the pitched roof element here and the mono pitch, which is to be replaced there. The outbuildings um, belonging to the terrace of properties are attached to the dwellings, as you can see here, by a sort of proliferation of unsightly service pipes and wires um, that cross the access. And, and this is approximately the position at which the glazed link would, 
upward cross, you can see it extends towards the pitched roof part of the outbuilding. There are existing private steps, as we've noted already, up alongside the um, application site, which provides access to the raised, uh, sorry, there's also steps along here and down here, which provides access to the raised garden to the rear. This shows how the outbuilding will look from the rear of the dwelling. So looking straight out of um, number one towards the outbuilding and also the um, section looking west from the gardens of the other properties in the terrace. So this is looking towards the shared steps with the link in here and then the flat roof element of the um, extension to the outbuildings. This projects approximately half a metre above the remaining garden. Uh, it's just a photo to remind you of the setting and you can see here with this section again um, the relationship with the garden at the rear. Now concerns were raised by the council's conservation team about potential damage to the property from excavation works that are going to be necessary to create the rear outbuilding extension. Ground stability um, is obviously an important consideration, uh, particularly in this location, which could potentially be impacted by increased coastal erosion in the future. So the submitted uh, ground stability report and the structural design certificate has been submitted and this satisfies your land engineers. And they, it confirms that there is no existing signs of land instability and that the additional loadings proposed by the excavation should be acceptable, provided that the works accord with the report. So your officers have recommended uh, condition four to do that. Um, on a related topic, uh, surface water, obviously um, an issue. This needs to be drained into a piped drainage system to avoid any slope instability that could occur if we use soakaways. So that is intended to be secured by condition number five. I think there's been some concern by neighbours that there's nothing on the far from Wessex water. It would be the requirement for the developer to agree uh, any new drainage connection that might be necessary with Wessex water to achieve um, compliance with the condition. Uh, back to the impacts on the heritage assets. These photos show the context for the proposed development. Again, slightly different viewpoints. And then this 3D indicative drawing shows how the glazed link would maintain views of the neighbouring outbuildings. And we've got some sort of lightweight railings here, which are for safety purposes, obviously, because of the difference in height le uh, levels, the height of the land. And wait, this isn't considered to be visually prominent, particularly set back as it is. So it's your side officer's view that the side and rear proposals uh, would not result in harm to the contribution made by the terrace and their outbuildings to the historic significance of the conservation area, nor the significance of the terrace as a non-designated heritage asset. So the proposal is considered to accord with policy LHH in this regard and the requirements of the National Planning Policy Framework. Uh, we've also given consideration to the impacts of the proposals on the area of outstanding natural beauty. Obviously heritage is a big part of that, um, but there's also the issue on potential for light spill to affect the character of the area. Um, given that, uh, the co given the context, so the existing windows, uh, the screening of the ex by the existing built form and the land levels, it's considered that a condition um, would be um, reasonable and necessary and would help to mitigate any outstanding um, impact from lighting. So that would require lighting details for the glaze link to be agreed prior to their installation, uh, just to avoid poorly directed lighting, um, which could affect uh, the locality and the neighbours. In terms of other impacts on neighbours, um, concerns have been raised um, about overlooking. Um, as you'll have already seen from the photographs I've shown you, there is a high level of mutual overlooking both from windows and from shared pedestrian and vehicular accesses and the raised nature of the outbuildings and the gardens. So it's not been considered necessary or reasonable to require the proposed additional side windows um, in, in here to be obscure glazed because uh, the old watch house, which is immediately opposite, um, has blank flank wall, so they wouldn't be mutually overlooking. The glazed link to the rear and the changes to the outbuilding are also not considered to result in demonstrable change. There will be change, but we don't think that the degree of um, 
additional overlooking compared to the existing mutual overlooking is going to be um, demonstrably harmful so as to warrant any sort of um, condition or refusal on those grounds. Proposed condition seven uh, requires that the side glazing in the proposed bay window um, at first floor level is obscure glazed and the reason for that proposed condition is to avoid any overlooking from this level into the um, windows on the old watch house. Also potential overlooking as it will extend into uh, number two. Um, there is already a panel at ground floor level which can be um, erected under permitted development rights which provides some screening at that level uh, for the neighbour number two. Um, other concerns relating to neighbouring amenity are set out in the report on pages 37 and 38. Um, given the physical site constraints, uh, we've required or suggested condition three, which requires that a construction environmental management plan is submitted to the council prior to commencement. So that would um, enable us to agree details such as um, access points, car parking for contractors, storage of materials, control of dust and things like that so that um, these details are properly planned in the interest of minimising disruption. In summary then, um, I'm not going to read out what it says on there, I'm just going to say for the reasons set out in the officer report and as I've just explained your officer recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions set out in paragraph 18 of the committee report. Thank you Madam Chair. Thank you very much Liz. Okay we will move on to the um, public representations. Chelsea would you like to read them out for us please? Thank you, Madam Chair. The first comment is from Imogen Stacey, who objects. This cottage is a part of a row of terrace cottages that are almost 200 years old and were built in the original Regency style in 1826 by William Morton Pitt. The cottages have significant local and historical interest. They are located on the Dorset Coastal Path and are very visible on the coastline from the shore and also when at sea. All the cottages have had minimal changes made externally and any changes that have been made were in keeping and also most were made a significant time ago. I'm writing this email on behalf of my mother, Diana Stacey, owner of number two Old Coast Guard Cottage and also the other objecting local residents. We feel that the plans will be very overlooking and create a further loss of privacy and light for current owners and residents. We feel that this is an overdevelopment for the size of a plot of land and is not in keeping with the Regency style that the original cottage was built in. This cottage is located in a Swanage conservation area. Many of the precedents that are being referenced as justification for these proposed changes were made well before the area was designated a conservation area in 1970. The proposed plans include heavy use of glass, which will create a further loss of privacy. This in the form of a two storey bay window extension at the front and a glass corridor on the first floor of the back of their cottage above a communal walkway, which has shared access rights. They are proposing to build a porch with a large glass roof window at the side of their cottage on the land of the communal walkway. The plans will, that will mean that current residents and owners of the cottages in this terrace will be further overlooked and there will be a further loss of privacy. The proposed front elevation is too modern in style with more glass and also aluminium window frames in opposition to the conservation officer's recommendations and not in keeping. Part of the argument for this application has been to create symmetry so number one will look more like number eight. The proposed front bay windows are not planned in the same style as number eight cottage. They're significantly larger in depth and width and much more modern in window style, using far more glass than number eight. On their ground floor, they plan to have doors spanning the width of their bay window extension. They already have a smaller set of double doors on the front of their cottage. The side porch will not support any symmetry in the row of cottages, as there is not one at the end, uh, other end of the row at number eight. The next comment is from Andrew and Janice Smith, who's the applicant. We very much hope that this planning committee accepts the recommendation of the plan officers and conservation officer and approves our application. The design has been arrived at after lengthy consultation with the planning and conservation officers together with our neighbours and it's particularly heartening that those neighbours who are resident within the terrace itself have written in support of our application. We confirm that we are happy to accept the conditions proposed by the case officer which we have discussed verbally but at the time of the reading have not seen in writing. We have a deep love and understanding of the conservation of important historic buildings and two of our past homes have been listed grade two star. We also have a deep love of Swanage and this particular part of Swanage which is hidden gem 
We understand our neighbours' concerns and fear of change, but sensitive alteration and conservation is just as important as important to us as to them, probably more so as this is going to be our permanent home. Following an extensive and sympathetic refurbish refurbishment of our house earlier this year, we have now moved in with our three young children and are desperately in need of the additional space that these proposed additions will create. It has also became very clear that means of escape is a matter of the utmost importance. Access within the house has been vastly improved by the replacement of the lower staircase and windows have been renewed at the rear with fully compliant means of escape windows. Whilst escape at first floor level, though these would be practical, the height of the second floor windows would, contrary to what one of the objectors contended, make a ladder escape extremely hazardous, particularly for young children. The first floor link is therefore vital to provide an alternative and safe escape route. It has also become clear that larger windows in the front elevation are also much needed. The lounge at first floor level currently has a very small window in the north elevation, which makes the room very dark internally. A larger window will not only improve the outlook towards the sea, but more importantly, vastly improve the natural lighting. Finally, the issue of privacy and light pollution has been raised by many objectors. We as residents are more concerned of our own privacy within the house and are happy to accept the officer's conditions with this respect. However, the charm of this terrace is the open plan nature of the front gardens. Residents and holiday homeowners and their children and grandchildren have enjoyed this open atmosphere for decades. And as far as we know, nobody wishes this to change. As for light pollution, this really is a nonsense. That's all the comments. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you very much. OK, we don't have um, a statement from the Town and Parish Council other than what they have submitted as part of the application process. But we do have one of the two ward members wishing to speak, and that's Bill Trite. Bill, you've already made your declaration, so the floor is yours. And then obviously afterwards, you will refrain from taking any further part in the determination of this application. Yes, uh, thank you, Chairman. Well, I had the uh, benefit of quite a long meeting with the applicant, Mr Andrew Smith, who was very open and approachable uh, and a highly experienced chartered surveyor. Nevertheless, I don't think his proposals are in the best interests of Swanage or most nearby residents, so I regret I must continue to oppose them. My remarks are endorsed by the other Dorset Council member for Swanage, Councillor Gary Suttle, who's currently away on holiday. The old Coast Guard cottages should have been uh, listed buildings many years ago, but I'm aware that Historic England's latest pronouncement says that they do not currently meet the criteria for listing. Uh, well, with, with these proposals now before the committee, they certainly never will be listed. Once again, I must say that this is an application which should really have or, or could have done with a, a site visit by the committee because although not listed, Coast Guard cottages are, uh, are a very important 200 year old heritage asset for both Swanage and Dorset. Now, I hope all committee members have read in the report the long list of objections from residents and the town council. They include what some people might consider relatively minor concerns, such as overlooking loss of daylight and loss of privacy, which particularly risk affecting number two Coast Guard cottages next door. Yet the report's statement that these disadvantages already exist to a degree surely cannot be taken as justification for more of the same, which is, of course, exactly what we will get. There's a comparable piece of special pleading at item 1524, where an objection is cited which says, and I quote it, increased bedrooms in the dwelling will have an impact on parking. The response in the report is that the dwelling in its present form could be occupied by any number of residents over which Dorset Council has no control. Yet in other cases, I frequently heard the council argue that allowing additional bedrooms would directly affect demands for parking, which of course it would, and it will in this case. And uh, if minor changes over time to other dwellings in Coast Guard cottages, which could be seen uh, at a visit, have not been exactly a complement to the conservation area, that's no reason to approve the more radical and modernistic changes here proposed for number one, which uh, represents serious overdevelopment of Coast Guard cottages Regency style. 
But the major concerns about these proposals are that they adversely impact one of Swanage's two conservation areas and the AONB. Modernism has its place, but here we should be doing what we can to protect places of greatest architectural and historic interest by conserving and enhancing traditional appearances. The modern design of this proposal is inescapably out of character with surrounding properties and the setting within the conservation area. I wonder whether we're ever going to pay more attention to the views of local people as expressed through their most immediate representatives, the town council. As the latter points out, the proposed bay window is obtrusive and out of keeping with the adjacent properties. The new porch is contrary to the appearance of the terrace and will have a significant adverse visual impact. Moreover, the glass corridor is completely out of keeping, intrusive to neighbours and also passes over a shared access passageway which leads to other properties in the terrace. Finally, if I may, the report's answers to objections yet again tend to consist of bare contradictions of the objections without showing why or how the objections are unreasonable, exaggerated or plain wrong. See, for instance, point 15.5, referring to objections to altering the character of the immediate area. After the list of flat contradictions, they are then described as reasons why reasons why the proposals result in no harm to the conservation area. They are actually not real reasons at all. Then in 1524, there's the unsubstantiated statement that, and I quote again, the level of noise resulting from use of the glass walkway is considered to be acceptable, unquote. Now, this is another example of a bare, apparently authoritative statement resting on no supporting argument or evidence. Chairman, I, I, I could go on, uh, but I think uh, by my own calculation, my time is up. So thank you for the opportunity to address the committee in this way. Thank you very much, Bill. Passionate as ever. Given um, some of the comments that you've made and some of the public representation, I'm going to ask both Liz and James Weir, the conservation officer, if they would like to respond to any of the comments being made. Liz, I'll go to you first. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just looking through my report. I know that there was um, not only an, a large number of objections, but also a decent number of um, comments in support of the application, which I think should just be mentioned. Um, if anybody would like to come up with a number, please feel free to let me know. Um, the In terms of um, Councillor Trite's concerns about um, the number of bedrooms um, in, and the impact on parking, um, this is a property which is obviously, as we've discussed, it's a historic building. It doesn't, it didn't have planning permission to first be built and therefore there's no control over what parking is or isn't provided for that um, building. Um, so in addition to the fact that we can't control how many people might live there and how many cars they might choose to own, um, we also can't control whether any parking is provided for that property in the first place. So it would be very difficult for us to argue that the proposals now before you would result in additional highway problems or a highway safety impact as a result of the increased number of bedrooms. Um, the noise issue that was raised just now, um, it, it is, you know, it's, it's a difficult one noise because until you have um, a proper noise assessment before you um, and you'd need a noise assessment post and pre and post the development to be able to assess what the difference is, um, we can't, you know, we can't give you hard evidence, but we have to say that this is a residential area where there are existing outbuildings, existing um, um, close proximity buildings to the dwellings that will all have some sort of noise impact during, say, a thunderstorm when there's heavy downpour and the additional noise that would arise from, say, rain hitting the um, glazed roof of the, the glazed walkway would not be um, to a degree that could be demonstrably demonstrated to harm neighbouring amenity. But I don't probably that doesn't 
um, provide much more clarity, but I wanted to try to explain that um, and, and any noise from you users of the building, users of the dwelling, users of the garden, again, would not be considered to be significantly different to uh, the current noise levels that would be anticipated um, at present as well. Um, James, did you want to respond in terms of the conservation area? Appraisal through you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Liz. <coughs> Sorry, apologies for my um, cold written voice. Um, I don't know how it sounds on the microphone. Uh, yeah, I don't have a, a great deal to uh, to add uh, in particular. The, the assessment provided in the officer report was um, essentially based on my sort of dispassionate and objective assessment using the uh, the standard procedures set out in the MPPF, uh, understanding significance uh, and impacts. Uh, in terms of the conservation area, um, I think I heard it sort of said that uh, the the proposals would result in significant adverse effects. Um, but again, we, we we have to base those comments on how we understand the character and appearance of that conservation area to be uh, in order for it to have substance. Um, and again, the, the, those uh, characteristics which I've sort of identified were drawn out of the conservation area appraisal. Um, again, there's no sort of summary of, of, of character and appearance for zone five, but um, I believe the features that that I've drawn out sort of adequately cover the uh, the thrust of, of the appraisals assessment of that particular area um, and applying that however uncomfortably uh, the result may however uncomfortable the result may seem applying that to the, applying the proposals to that uh, sort of resulted in in our conclusions um, and of course you know the uh, the historic England uh, the result of their listing is is also undertaken to their own objective assessment and again, those results can often be uncomfortable as well, but unfortunately um, the, the realities are, are what they are. Um, yeah, so I don't have <coughs> anything else in particular to, to say other than that. Madam Chairman, Kim Cowell here, if I may just come in very briefly. Um, Liz at the beginning asked if, if somebody could assist with a tally of how many letters we'd had in support. If, if I can draw members' attention to page um, 27 of the agenda. You can see there's a small table there which identifies and the table reads total objections 42, um, total um, no objections, oblique support 25 and other comments 7. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification Kim. Okay, um, I have one speaker and one request to look again at the view four that we're looking at at the moment. Um, I'll come back to you in a moment, Julie. Alex, do you wish to speak? Uh, a question, please, Chair, th to, through you to the officers. Um, the depth of the proposed porch for number one, the, pro the amount it projects from the front of the property compared with the projection of the existing bay windows on number eight would be an interesting um, comparison. And also the pitch on top of the bay windows, which is shown in the indicative drawing as being completely flat pitched on top of the second, on top of the first floor roof of the bay window. Is that so or is there actually a, a slope there? Thank you. Liz, do you want to come back on those questions? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I will need to check the depth. I don't have it before me in terms of this, the depth on number eight. I know that the depth on, of proposed on number one uh, was on the plan I put up just now. So somebody asked for the, the link. So, so that's why that one's before you. And if I could just... Um, Liz, do you it. have, there, there's a further request saying, uh, do you have a slide showing the walkway from the top of the steps looking down? Um, not, a, not a plan view like this, these indicative 3D ones, no. Um, you can see if I, oh, I have to remember which way my um, slideshow goes. One minute, please. Uh, I think if I go this way, we can see, uh, so this, it would be, just glimpsed maybe um, at sort of that height first floor and then it's coming from this door 
out across. Um, so we, again, you would you would glimpse it there and again from this direction. You would see it come across. Actually, you probably wouldn't even see it there because it would be hidden just behind the uh, the roof of. The outbuilding. Which is the neighbor's outbuilding, it's that one there in that view. Um, if you will give me a couple of minutes, I can look up um, the. Depth of the um, bay at number eight. And then if I just go forward to. Uh, it's gonna, somewhere near the front, isn't it? Okay. So I think it was asked about the pitch. This is a this is pretty much a flat roof. Um, and yeah, sorry if somebody could remind me what the question was in, in relation to the pitch. It was it was um, about the projection of the porch. Projection of the porch, which is the same um, as is, is it the same as the bay? Does it come further yeah, than the bay? Yeah, we go. It's the same as the bay. <laughs> I need to if I stop presenting. Sorry. Can you see that? It's marginal, isn't it? It's pretty much the same that the the roof might be slightly over, but otherwise it's in line. OK. Julie, does that answer your questions? Sorry, Alex, I'll get it right in a minute. Alex, you asked the question about the porch. It wasn't so much the porch because I can see that the porches of the other properties project a bit as well. I wanted to know really the projection of the sort of the bay window and upstairs, how much it would project out because that affects obviously overlooking. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. But I, it, how much does the bay window on number eight project is the sort of can we play symmetry or is it a, very much asymmetrical? That was my uh, question. Yeah. Um, for you, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. um, I think the I, I can I can try and look up the, how much it projects, although I don't think I've got um, a detailed plan. But um, from an from the office's perspective, although they they're not um, they're not symmetrical in terms of you know all their detail or even potentially the, the exact depth, because they're seen at either end of the terrace, you you see the the sort of principle of the bay projection more than you will be able ever able to see you know or is that one 10 centimeters deeper than the other i i just wanted to sort of make that point please i think the answer is that they are similar even if they're not identical thank you <laughs> okay does that answer your question alex i need to move on can, can i just put one more question in there um, Very quickly. About the, pit. the reason i asked about the pitch of the roof of the bay window was concerns that a few people have mentioned to me that could it at a later date then become a, a standing on platform, which I would doubt, but um, and also be, if it is flat pitch completely, are the, um, are the gutterings and rain catchment associated with this flat roof or is it going to just sort of fall off any rain? Bearing in mind it's on the north side, and nor northwesterly gales do hit that side of the buildings. I just wondered in terms of the future, are we asking for a sort of a, to be sure that it's not going to become an issue with rains shooting off and going in over next door? OK, Liz, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it's, a, it's a good question. It's not what, something that I have particularly um, concerned myself with at this stage. Um, the. I think the answer is that the the um, it's, a, it's a pretty small surface area, so any water that is coming off that um, 
that small area of roof um, isn't going to be a massive um, deluge unless you know it's already raining very heavily anyway. Um, so it's not something that um, I would be concerned about in terms of residential amenity and the planning process. OK, I'm going to move on now. Julie, you asked to see some of the slides and they've been put up for you. Was there any question attached to those or are you quite happy now? I'm quite happy now. Thank you, Chairman. OK, thank you. My next speaker then is Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, and thank you to the officer for Ms Adams for a really good presentation. Um, I've got two two questions. The first one is just a, 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 a an assurance really the glazed walkway and um, with all the service pipes and electrics that were going across that um, the, the back passageway way there which obviously gives access to all of the buildings I think it's a, a communal passageway if I understand it that you can get access to all the buildings I just wanted a confirmation that that glazed walkway doesn't interfere with head height I'm sure it doesn't and my other question is um, that glazed walkway I couldn't see in the report about the sides of that that glazing on that walkway. Would it be obscured glazing? Through you, Madam Chair. Uh, so the glaze link is approximately 2.2 metres above ground level, so it, it should shouldn't cause an issue for head height. And it's not proposed that they are obscure glaze. So the assessment has been on the basis that they are clear glaze sides. Could I come back, Madam Chairman? Um, can I go back, Madam Chairman? You're, you're on mute, Madam Chairman, sorry. Sorry, yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, so the, the officers were happy with it being non-obscured glazing. Do I understand that to be? Yeah, That's OK. So it would be possible to put into a condition that the sides panels would be obscured glazing um, to ensure privacy both for the occupants of um, number one and for the other occupants in, in the terrace of Coast Guard cottages. Uh, through you Chair, so um, our concerns doing that would be that you then it would become a much a sort of visually weightier structure. So the, the intention with the clear glazing is that you can still see views through, that um, that there's light isn't affected and um, so, so yeah, it's a, it's a really lightweight structure. So as soon as you obscure glaze those sides, um, then obviously it becomes a, a, a heavier structure visually. You won't be able to see through it, it'll obscure views. Um, so we've considered it as submitted with the, with the clear glaze thing and have considered that because of the uh, already the mutual interlooking that's going on in that area and um, yeah, because of uh, the use of the outbuildings and um, the pre-existing overlooking from from the hillside that actually on balance the, um, you know, the neighbouring level, the impact from just that glazer link on neighbouring amenity isn't isn't going to be harmful. OK, all right, thank you. OK, are you happy? Um, <laughs> with the, with the Content with the response is what I Content meant. with the response, yeah, but with the bathroom at the far end, I'm a little bit okay, concerned. I, I shall move on then. Mike Barron. Hello, Madam Chair. It's a paragraph 1545 that I'm a bit concerned about. It says that, as noted above, the drainage engineer has considered the proposal and considers that the minimal increase in impermeable area would, would result in an increased flood risk from surface water drainage. However, a condition can be included on the decision to ensure that no soakaway is used. Uh, can is a strange word there. It would, would simply be should or, or will be. Thank you, Madam Chair. Liz, would you like to respond to that, please? Uh, through you, Madam Chair, I'm happy with any of those words. Uh, basically, it's it's your it's members' opportunity uh, to impose conditions. Um, officers would recommend that a condition is imposed. Thank you. And we have condition five, uh, which says that all surface water from the development hereby approved shall be discharged to a piped drainage system and not to a soak away mm -hmm. for the interests of ground stability. Are you content with that wording, Mike? Yes, Madam Chairman. OK, thank you. My next speaker then is David Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, when I read the report, I seem to recall um, that 
the outbuilding, uh, the extension thereof, included drilling into the rock. And I just wanted assurance about the stability of what is proposed because um, one of the um, objections I think was the fact that um, it could affect the stability uh, of, of that terrace. Uh, uh, I hear that there is a plan uh, put in place obviously but I just wanted assurance that um, you know that the stability would be maintained uh, and there wouldn't be any uh, you know great earth movement uh, which could result thinking of climate change and all the severe weather and heavy rainfall we get that could be quite a consideration uh, i'm sure i can be given that assurance from uh, from liz but that was uh, my question madam chairman uh, mike has dealt it with the drainage which was my other question because uh, again, in view of the severe weather that we can get, that's, uh, that's quite important. But I did read that it was going to be uh, not to a soak away. Yeah. Uh, looking to the drainage. Thank you. OK, condition four talks about slope stability, but Mike Garrity, you wanted to come in. Thank you, Chair. Yes, it, it was actually in relation to a previous point. I just wanted to make an issue about the, the, the there was a question about the rainwater uh, on the roof um, i just wanted to make members aware of the fact that any developer would also need to be subject to building regulations approval and, and issues like dealing with uh, with rainwater are covered in in document h of the building act so so actually they would have to go through a process of ensuring they were making adequate provision for for drainage of any any rainwater coming off the building through the building regulations process so so Liz had alluded to the fact there weren't any planning concerns. I think there's a separate part of the process, which is through the building regulations that, that would be covered in any case. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. So um, going back to David Morgan, the concerns are about stability and the um, intrusion into the rock behind the outbuildings. Liz, do you want to come back for me, please, on that? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So um, the, the comments that Mike has just provided are, are very relevant here too, because um, as planners, we've um, got the assurance from um, having a ground stability report in the first instance that our land engineer has checked and it has been um, satisfied that at the moment there isn't any ground stability issues that we should be aware of when making this decision and um, that has considered what the additional loadings will be from the proposal and is satisfied that they should be adequate. But there's the next, uh, having done that, if, if planning commission is granted, then during the development process, again, building control will, will come into play and we'll be ensuring that uh, the loads of the retaining walls and the foundation design are all appropriate and will avoid um, any issues that have been alluded to. Thank you. Thank you. David, does that uh, help your concerns? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. OK, I've got two more speakers. Uh, Alex, you've already had one bite at the cherry, so I'm going to go to David Took first and then come back to you. David. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, surprisingly quick. Um, I'm curious. Um, can I just clarify? the excavation into the rock at the far side and, and the extension of the current outbuilding that will create a bedroom and bathroom is that correct uh, for you madam chair it's just the bathroom but there will be a bedroom in the in the outbuilding that is correct um at the moment it's already used as a sort of utility room um area and that's proposed to be changed Thank you. Um, my understanding is that there are policies in terms of a number of car parking spaces related to the number of bedrooms. Certainly in East Dorset, which I'm more familiar with, that's that seems to be the case. Is that not the case in Purbeck? Do you, Madam Chair? Uh, the Dorset residential parking guidance applies throughout throughout Dorset. 
So if this was a new build, we'd be looking at how many bedrooms has it got and we'd be seeking to ensure that the number of parking spaces is appropriate for that size of that building. In this case, because it's not a new build, it's a pre-existing dwelling, it has no conditions requiring any parking to be provided at all. Um, as I've already explained, uh, to now impose a condition that there should be however many parking spaces provided would be unreasonable in your officer's opinion. OK, thank you. Thank you. Does that help your questions, David? It helps the question. I'm not sure that the differentiation between new build and an extension is, is a really valid one. Um, parking is parking and bedrooms are bedrooms. And it, it seems an artificial distinction to me. However, I, I, I hear what the officer is saying. I think it's more to do with the age of the original buildings and their original construction. Yeah, I appreciate that. That it predates everything else. Appreciate it. Okay. That. Robin, you haven't spoken yet. I'm going to come to you next. Well, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. You caught me on the hop there. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, I do have a question. But first of all, I will say with the things like these cottages, which are not listed as we've heard, I think what it is, it's always a process of evolution, isn't it, over the t over time that people take care of them and, and change them, etc. I think this is very ingenious, to say the least, the way this has been thought through. The question is, the slide we're looking at now, slide 16, with the stairs on the right. Now, that's a public access way, as I understand it. Um, where does it lead to and from and what's any idea what the sort of traffic levels are likely to be on that? Is it just for the cottages or does it go on to serve much other areas? What sort of foot traffic? Do we have any idea? Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Um, so at the top of uh, the, the steps there, there's a gate and it says private on it. So it's a definitely a private access um, used by, my understanding is, those who reside in that little area. So there's the eight cottages that form part of Old Coast Guard Terrace. And then there's um, the, the watch house. I'm going to get the name wrong, I apologise. That's next door. Um, and then there's uh, houses further beyond, but it's likely that they would use the, the bridal way of the private road basically to get up and to the top. And this is the bridal way along the top here. But as I say, from, from the bridal way, it's a private, no trespassing type situation. So the foot traffic would not, it would be relative to the number of people who live in the, in the properties and rather than high. Thank you. If I can just come back, Madam Chairman, so one would never assume, but I think it's safe to assume then it's not likely to be frequented by hordes of people on day trips going down to have a look. Uh, basically, that's it. So with that glass, bearing in mind what Councillor Bartlett said about, you know, infilling the glazing or obscuring the glazing. OK, that's fine. I, I'm happy with that answer. Thanks very much. OK, thank you. Alex, you wanted to come back. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, actually, I just I have not have not got a question. I thought we were beginning to move on to comments or discussion. Is that all right? I roll it all into one. OK, um, so I'll just say my piece now, I think. Um, I note in the. On the documents. There have been there has been an awful lot of buzz about this on, in sort of people writing in and making comments and surprising number of them, because I assumed when I first started going through them that they would be from locals saying don't touch our swanage. But in fact, a surprising number of the opponents to this are people who have used this. Terrace of, uh, of cottages, whether this particular property or one of the neighbouring ones, as holiday homes. This is a very much a holiday home area. And the first thing that they all say is when they're in Swanage, they are out on boats and they like to look back at the cottages. And this is a very significant terrace in terms of the sea view. It's easy to say, oh, well, you know, nobody really sees this apart from very, very close or very, very far away. But there is because Swanage is a port, there is an awful lot of boat traffic in and out. It, they may not be big boats. So I was quite surprised at how much opposition there was to this from holidaymakers, not just from the local Swanage heritage groups and people like that. 
And having been out in the bay myself and looking back at the Coast Guard cottages, I think we do have to bear considerable account of what they look like from the sea, because so much of Swanage has been altered. There's only a few bits where you just go, oh, they look nice. Um, there's a lot of very modern stuff and this putting modern glazing um, fenestration down the front of a sort of 19th century building does change the atmosphere. I know that number eight has got some slightly more, I mean, not very modern, but um, should we say this century uh, glazing to the front or probably last century actually now, isn't it? Um, but I am worried about the view from the sea um, as a whole. That is a sideways on picture that's on the screen now. Uh, but if you look at say the Airbnb pictures where they're selling these cottages as holiday homes, it is very much a full four square sort of shot that they show. And the symmetry between the both ends is quite important. Um, and I just think we do need to bear in mind very much this business of making sure that we don't pick away at our uh, built heritage in places like Swanage. Um, so that concerns me. My other bit is that uh, and it says in condition seven, this business of overlooking and um, whether it's intrusive to the neighbours. I see that in in um, and it is rather dismissed in some of the um, officer report that, oh, it's no worse than it was before sort of attitude. Um, no, no additional harmful impacts and all that. Uh, but in condition seven, we say that this or that one of the conditions is that the side panels of the bay window should be obscured and non opening. Well, I mean, my instinct is if you have to obscure glass, it is intrusive. Looking at a at, at a obscured glass window is actually more intrusive than looking at a clear glass window. Um, what if you are living in number one and you have a bay window looking to the north, but your first instinct is going to be to look to the east for the sunrise and the west for sunset. So you are creating a sort of glass tunnel that only lets you look north. That isn't the point of a bay window. So I wonder how much, you know, if we've got to impose a condition like this, then surely it is wrong to start with. That tends to be my instinct at the moment. Um, the glass walkway at the back, in some ways I have less issue with because I agree that obscure glass there would actually make it seem a much blockier and intrusive um, building. But I am concerned because obviously that that back passageway is where people carry in furniture, equipment and even 2.2 if it's clear glass, you know, you think of carrying a sofa in. It, this is quite restrictive for other residents use of that back passageway because everybody's a little bit wary of glass. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that if you are walking down that walkway and this is reputed to be from now on a holiday, a, a family home, which one assumes is children as well. There it, it's a lovely place if you're a child to stand and see what the neighbours are up to. They might walk straight through. Adults would walk straight through, but you can imagine kids play up there sort of um, having quite a nice time sitting in the warm in the sun because that's the south side of the building so it's going to be sunnier and um, I'd, be, I'd be sitting there quite merrily reading a book or playing marbles if I was a kid. These modern kids perhaps do other things so I do wonder about the intrusion intrusion factor of having that walkway there. Uh, so I am still slightly undecided but my instinct is I don't like the effect on the front and I think the walkway at the back could become in effect almost another patio because it's going to be lovely and sunny. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for that, Alex. Shane, you wanted to come back.
Yes, thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. I wonder if I could ask um, Ms Adams to um, put up the slide that showed the um, interpretation of the new bay window. The artist representation, I think it was. Sorry, I didn't remember what oh, number slide it, it was. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in condition, in report on conditions at number eight, um, it says the materials to be used on the external faces of the development shall be in accordance with the details of proposed materials included in the plan application form dated 30th of 1st 21, with the exception of the window frames, which may be black painted softwood or black powder coated alloy. Window frames must be inset to match original fenestration of the property. Reason to safeguard the character and appearance of the property within the conservation area. Um, I'm at present at the moment with the discussion that we've had and the questions that have been asked and have been answered. I'm in a position where I'm predisposed to approve this plan application. However, I do have a sympathy with the local ward member and with others that have raised a concern about the modernistic look of the building. When you look at number eight um, with the with the bay windows as, as they sit there, they are slightly different in appearance to the one that is being proposed and the in the artist representation that we have at number one. Um, in terms of the symmetry of the building, I think putting the bay windows in will vastly improve the symmetry of that building. We've already lost the symmetry to a certain extent because of the alterations that have been made to and extensive alterations that have been made to number eight of Old Coast Garden Colleges. So what I would ask the officer is, would it be possible to change or to add wording to our number eight along the lines of that the design and appearance should be sympathetic to the look and design of number eight to facilitate a more pleasing and symmetrical appearance of Coast Guard cottages as a whole and avoid overly modern look and appearance. Think of some tweaking could be done around those bay windows, then I certainly would be um, in a position that I would I, I, I would go with an approval on this plan application. Uh, through you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. um, Councillor Bartlett, we have to consider what's before us in terms of the elevation plans. So if you're suggesting amendments to the form, size, design of, of that bay, then that wouldn't be something that we could do via condition. Via condition, we can control how it's built out in terms of the materials. We could ask for um, additional details in relation to, say, um, the uh, joinery details in this case, it, it would be probably um, aluminium detailing, but um, your officer's um, suggested condition would just secure um, the conditions to match, um, sorry, materials to match. So you've got the, the white render, the dark frames, the, um, the tiles to match those of the existing property and um, we can't go further than that in terms of influencing the design at this stage. Thank you. OK, so I can go back, Madam Chairman. So as far as you could go as officers, that was just to put that white banding in as as we you discussed earlier within your report. Through you, Madam Chair, through, the reason for that is because it is it is shown as white banding on the elevation plan, which we, would be the one that would be approved. And it was just to clarify that that should be white in case there was um, an interpretation that, that the dark um, banding could be achieved as shown on the 3D drawing, which I don't think would be appropriate. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, if I could come back. Yeah. OK, um, it's, it's a pity that we can't that we're not able to um, strengthen the design of that. So it's more in accordance with um, number one. Sorry, number eight Coast Guard cottages. So, but that said, um, I think it is an innovative design. I think it does af af afford the, the the use of the cottage for a, a young family. Um, I, I think that the the use of the of the of the building to the rear and the alterations that are going to be done there, I think are, are acceptable. And I think as as the, as it has been laid out within the report, it's not a listed building. It is subject to having. Uh, additional works done that. I think um, Councillor Cook summed it up perfectly when he said that these types of buildings do evolve over a period of time. And I think on the basis of all of that and as laid out in the officer's report, Madam Chairman, then I'm minded to propose that we um, approve as a minded to decision. Thank you. OK, thank you. 
does that include the extra wording that Liz spoke about at the start of her presentation? It, it does, Madam Chairman. OK, is there a seconder, please? Robin Cook. Yeah, happy to second, Madam Chairman. Thank you on the basis of what we've seen there and with the uh, amendment as shown on slide eight. OK, thank you. I have no other speakers, so I will put it to the vote. So roll call. Shane Bartlett. I have listened to the entire presentation, taken part in the debate, Madam Chairman, and I am minded to approve the decision. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Barron. I've listened to the debate, Madam Chairman, I also taken part and I am also minded to approve. Thank you. Alex Brenton. I've listened to the debate and taken part and I am. I reject or I vote against the proposal. Okay. Good. Thank you. Robin Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I've seen the present full presentation, taken part, listened to the debate and I'm minded to support the recommendation. Thank you. Mike Dyer. Uh, I've been present throughout, listened to the debate and the presentation and um, I'm minded to approve. Thank you. Barry Gorringe isn't here. David Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've listened to the debate and taken part and I'm minded to approve. Thank you. Judy Robinson. I've listened to the presentation and the debate. Um, I'm split, to be honest. I'm happy with the front, but I'm not happy with the back, so I'm going to abstain. OK. Uh, David Took. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've listened to the debate and taken part in it. I am marginally minded to approve. Uh, Bill Trite is um, unable to vote on this application. John Worth. Um, I've listened to the debate and I might need to approve. OK, thank you. David Northover, do you want to give the outcome of the vote, please? Yes, Chairman. Seven for, one against and one abstention. OK, so in that case, the application is granted with the extra wording as shown on slide eight. Thank you all very much, members. OK, we will sorry, now move. Sorry, Chairman, could I just come in there? I oh, think. It's... Yeah, just, sorry <laughs> to interrupt. Every time. Yeah. I'm it's so easy, isn't it? <laughs> so, yes, yeah. Mike Garrity, would you like to give your delegation on our minded to decision? Yeah, th thank you, Madam Chairman. Yeah, I confirm I have heard the debate and that this application will be determined in line with the committee's minded to decision. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. So now it definitely has been granted. Apologies to everyone on that. I jumped the gun yet again. So moving on then, agenda item six is to retrospectively to undertake concrete repairs on the underside of arches repair, replace stones in headwalls and repoint, and to repair a concrete footpath, install loose rock aprons at Bryant's Puddle Bridge, Bryant's Puddle, and that's on pages 45 to 54 on your um, agenda. The Oliver Hayden is the case officer for this one. Oliver, over to you, please. Thank you and good morning, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Oliver Hayden. I'll be taking us through the following committee item for respective uh, retrospective listed building consent for repairs to Bryant's Puddle Bridge submitted by Dorset Highways. Whilst the application was submitted prior to works being carried out due to the timing, budget and ecological constraints of the environmental permit, temporary traffic regulation order and road closure permit and to ensure the best use of resources before the winter period, the works have since been completed. The officer's recommendation is to grant listed building consent. The application site lies just north of the village of Bryant's Puddle. And the road bridge connects the village with the A35 to the north, as shown here. In more detail, the bridge's proximity to the village fringe can be seen to the south. And as shown here, the bridge is a grade two listed structure located in the much larger Piddle Valley conservation area. 
Approaching the bridge from the south, one can see the footpath on the left. It's worth noting that this image was taken prior to the repair works being carried out. Following structural investigations into the condition of the bridge, Dorset Highways saw it necessary to undertake a number of repairs to spalled stone on the archways and concrete on the underside of the bridge. Repairs to the footpath and mitigation works to avoid ongoing scour were also deemed necessary. The plan displayed shows the level and area of scour prior to the repair works being undertaken. Vegetation growth within the channel was leading to an increase in velocity of the flow around the central cutwater, scouring the riverbed and undermining the foundations. The mitigation carried out by Dorset Highways uh, saw to lay a mix of flint and perfect stone around the foundations of the upstream and downstream cutwaters to reduce the concentration of faster flows. The repairs have now been carried out and can be seen in these following photographs. Here, the stone replacements and concrete repairs are also shown. So the council's conservation officer discussed the repairs with the applicant and raised no objections. The public benefits of the proposal are that they would protect the bridge from potential structural failure and secure continued safe pedestrian and vehicular access across the bridge, avoiding the need to detour through neighboring aft puddle. Whilst the proposals would result in harm to the listed bridge, the degree of harm is deemed less than substantial and the aforementioned public benefits outweigh this level of harm. The recommendation is therefore to grant listed building consent. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. I think that's one of the most concise reports <laughs> I've ever had at planning committee. Uh, I suppose one of the benefits of a retrospective application is you can have the photographic evidence of what's uh, gone on. Shane, I'm going to come to you as first speaker. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you to the officer for the report. And as you say, it was quite concise. And if you blink, you would have missed it. Um, it was really, really good. A lot of information given within that report. Um, Madam Chairman, this is a, re a retrospective um, um, application that's before us on this Grade 2 listed structure. Uh, and I'm, I'm always quite impressed at the length, 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 longevity of these, these types of structures, these bridges. I think this was an 18th century one, I think, or 1800s um, and probably was an existing one previous to this one on the site. Uh, you do wonder whether modern bridges are going to um, be able to perform as well and still be, able, still be there in a couple of centuries time, assuming we can get the drivers to drive the HGVs over them, which is a moot point at the moment, um, when you consider that this one was actually designed to cope with horses and carts. I've got to commend the stonemasons for the work they've done um, from the photograph evidence we've got in front of us. That is quite stunning work and as uh, we are uh, you know, it is within us as Dorset Council that we have to protect these these assets, and they've done a really sterling job on that. Um, and in terms of the the uh, the stone that's been put in on the riverbed to protect the bridge from potential structural failure in the future, um, getting in early and doing those types of work, I think is a common sense approach. So on the basis of that, Madam Chairman, I am I would I think that we I'm minded to um, approve this application as it stands. Thank you. OK, thank you. David Took, you've indicated you wish to speak. Do you wish to second the application? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I will second the application. Um, I, I think the, the repairs have been done. Quite well, um, from what I can see. Um, and, and the alternative to not repair it is for the thing to fall down. So that seems like a, a fairly straightforward a case of this needs to be done. What I would question is why we're having to look at a retrospective application. It would have been far better if this application had been dealt with before the fact rather than after. Um, although in the event it probably makes no difference. But thank you. Yes, I'll second. I'll second the uh, the approval. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask Oliver to reiterate what he said in his initial presentation about the reasons why it became a retrospective application. Sure. Yeah. Un unfortunately, it came in with uh, if everything was was lined up in a row with um, getting stuff through the support team and, and consultation and adver advertisement that we all need to do at our end, then uh, we may have got a decision out in time. But the environment agency's permit, um, they're obviously tied by e ecological constraints and they want stuff doing before winter period arrives and um, they can tend to get that, those permits out a lot quicker. Um, so it's one of those 
you're never going to get everything in a row. And unfortunately, um, th this was the one that fell behind. But as you said, we, we are we do have the benefit of um, being able to view the works. But in an ideal world, uh, everything would have been would have been granted beforehand. There were just too many constraints with something like this. Yeah, too many moving parts that you couldn't get aligned. Yeah. OK, are you happy with that response, David? Uh, yes, I, I think I will, I'm, I'm content with it. Um, yeah. I, I, I still think that if process is the problem, then process needs improving. But thank you. Yeah, I think that's something that, that we'll take away and look at for the future. But I think it was a perfect storm on this occasion. So I have no other speakers. Um, it's been proposed and seconded for grant. I shall go through the roll call. So just get to my list so I make sure I don't leave anybody off because then you will uh, not thank me. OK, so Shane Bartlett. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, I heard the uh, presentation by the officer and I took part in the limited debate as it was, and I am minded to approve the application as laid out in the officer's report. Thank you. Thank you. Mike Barron. Hello, Madam Chairman. I've listened to uh, this concise debate very, very quickly and uh, I vote to approve. Thank you. Alex Brenton. Thank you, Chair. I've been here throughout. I was aware this bridge was needing some repairs and I look forward to having enough petrol to go and have another look at it. Now it's been <laughs> mended. I vote for. <laughs> Thank you. Robin Cook. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I've uh, seen the, listened to the full presentation and the debate and I'm minded to support the recommendation. Thank you. Mike Dyer. Uh, I've listened to the full presentation, been present throughout and approved, Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Barry Gorringe isn't here. David Morgan. I've listened, Madam Chairman, to the excellent and concise uh, report uh, and I'm minded to approve. Thank you. Judy Robinson. Thank you, Chairman. I've listened to the presentation and I'm minded to approve. Thank you. David Took. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've listened to the presentation um, and I'm very much minded to approve. Thank, thank you. you. Bill Trite, welcome back. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I've listened to everything that's been said and um, I, I vote in favour. Thank you. And John Worth. Yes, I've listened to the presentation and I'm minded to approve. Thank you. I will go to David for a formal uh, result, but it sounds unanimous to me. It is unanimous, Chairman. Ten for, none against. Lovely. So our minded to decision is to grant. I shall now go to Mike Garrity and for the first time I've actually remembered to give his delegated decision. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I can confirm that I've heard the debate and that this application will be determined in line with the committee's minded to decision. Thank you. Thank you. I get something right eventually. OK, so moving back to the agenda, uh, we go on to the planning appeals summary. Kim, I believe you want to speak to committee on some of the yes. content of this one, please. If I may, Madam Chairman, um, members, we brought these to um, appeals back to you because they were both decisions taken at committee contrary to officer recommendation. We felt that you would want to know what the inspector had concluded with regard to each of them. Um, the first is um, an, an application that was refused for single storey extensions um, with pitch roofs, roof lights and rainwater harvesting tank at five Ballard Estate. I recall there was a um, a considered debate with regard to that application and members concluded that the application should be refused um, because of the bulk of the roof which they considered would have a harmful impact on the local character of that um, particular estate and also um, contrary to policies um, within both the Swanage local plan and the Purbeck local plan. The, the inspector did acknowledge the distinctiveness of the Ballard estate and that their proposal would increase the footprint. But the inspector judged that the proposal would relate well to the size of the existing dwelling, wouldn't appear over dominant in respect to the size of the plot. And he 
also consider that the proposed roof, along with the overall scale, would ensure that the proposal wouldn't appear overbearing within the street scene and, and didn't support the members reasons for refusal on that basis. Um, also considered the, um, the fact that because the ridge wasn't being raised, um, that that would respect the prevailing form of development on the estate and protect the distinctive character of the area. There was some discussion I recall amongst members that it was it was going to appear as a two storey building. He addressed that in his report and concluded that it, that the um, that the extension because the ridge wasn't being raised would, wouldn't have the appearance of a two storey um, wouldn't have a two storey form. With regard to the rainwater harvest tank, there were concerns there from members. Um, the the um, inspector concluded that there was no evidence to suggest that that would be unacceptable in the location, but did impose a condition um, due to the limited information that was before him. Um, the inspector also considered the impact on living conditions of neighbouring properties, um, which included overbearing, overshadowing, loss of light, but concluded no harm to adjacent occupiers' living conditions, or from overlooking from the roof lights. And I know Councillor Brenton mentioned before about obscure glazing, but obscure glazing does have a, 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 a role to play where overlooking is concerned clearly. And in this instance, with the roof lights, which were um, which are to be fixed shut and obscured, he can, the inspector concluded there that that would mitigate any impact on third parties. Um, so in, in that's, that's a summary. I thought you would want the feedback because members are quite specific about their, their, their concerns and the reasons for refusal. And the inspector considered them each in turn, but concluded that the, um, that the application was acceptable in all respects. Okay, With before regard we move on, hmm? uh, Kim, hmm? Bill Trite wanted to make a comment by all means yeah uh, thank you thank you chair thank you chairman um you know it'll come as no surprise to members to hear me say how appalling this um, this appeal ruling is i don't know whether i'm allowed to call an inspector naive but if i am i hereby do so uh, because what uh, has been decided literally contradicts decades of careful determination to protect the special character of the Ballard estate where single storey buildings are in very close proximity to each other since they all derive from old um, First World War army huts which were of course themselves very close to each other. We're, we, we're now likely to face uh, on that estate what is sometimes called a race to the bottom which in planning terms is a, is a very unfortunate thing. Um, I, I really do regret the, the folly of this, uh, of this uh, uh, outcome, but um, there it is, there's nothing I can do about it. And we shouldn't be afraid to express our views if they happen to uh, be uh, uh, opposite to those of officers. You're on mute. Thank, I know, I've just realised. Thank you very much, but I, I know where you're coming from on this one. Kim, you wanted to continue? If I may. Um, the second application that um, went to appeal was um, a proposal for a single storey rear extension with a sedum roof at Misty Cottage in Worth, Matravers, um, which was refused at committee in January 2020. Um, the reasons for refusal were for reasons of overbearing impact on a neighbour of Rose Cottage and um, the impact on the setting of a grade two listed building and on the conservation area. Kim, okay, um, just to interrupt your flow mm, very quickly, members will recall mean. we did a site visit on this one. Excellent, thank you. Okay. This predates me, so I wasn't at that site visit, so thank you for sharing that. Um, the um, the inspector on this one um, recognised that due to the levels, the extension would be visible um, beyond the site, but considered the scale and form would preserve um, the significance of the conservation area and, um, and also not have a harmful impact on the AMV. And he considered again the use of obscure glazing would assist in preserving the immunity of the adjoining neighbour, and that appeal was also allowed. Um, planning is subjective. And clearly, these two 
applications evidence that um, a difference of opinion. So thank you, members. OK, thank you very much, Kim. Um, we're on to the last item on the agenda now, and that's item eight, urgent items. And I'm pleased to say that there are none today. So can I thank you all for your time and your contribution today? And we will see you at the next meeting. Thank you, Chairman. David. Uh, just just to uh, to clarify for members, it might be worth taking this opportunity. Of course, our next scheduled meeting um, was to be the 27th of October, and that will still be going ahead as far as I'm aware. Um, you will see from correspondence from me, there is another meeting now scheduled for Wednesday 13th of October, starting at 3 p.m. in the afternoon. I can confirm that that will still take place virtually. We had intended to be going back to face to face meetings. That will happen as soon as practicable. We're waiting for the webcasting facility to be um, as we would want it to be. It's very close to that, but uh, it won't be in time for the 13th. So that will be taking place virtually. OK, thank you for that reminder. So members, we will see you all virtually on the 13th. And can I thank everyone again for their contribution today? The meeting is now over. Thank you. Thank you, thank Madam, you Madam Chairman. Chairman. Thank you, thank Madam, you Madam Chairman. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.